Thank you, Carol, and uh, thank you one and all for your welcome. And Nigel, thank you for your contribution. And Kerry, and it's nice to have you with us this morning. Nice to be back in Coleraine uh, to worship with you. And lovely to see people, isn't it? You know, we can Zoom all we like, but there's just something about the buzz and chat and seeing people eye to eye. So I appreciate that very much. Our call to worship this morning is taken from Psalms, taken from Psalm 100. And let me just read some vo vo uh, verses to you. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us and we are his people. We are his people, the sheep of his pastures. We're going to stand together and sing. And our first song is Come Let Us Sing of a Wonderful Love. Let us unite our hearts in prayer. Let us pray. Father God, we do thank you that in this morning that we can join together in fellowship. Fellowship that we, we can see one another face to face. And oh, for the day that we will see you face to face. But in the meantime, we thank you that you are here present amongst us by your Holy Spirit. Almighty and loving God, we thank you for the assurance we have that you are always with us. And it is in you that 
we find help and strength in times of trouble and whatever we face, you are always there to reach out and to save us. We thank you that you are present not only here, but everywhere, and that no one, no one is outside your love and no place beyond your concern this morning. You are a faithful God. We thank you that you, you hold us firmly, even when we try to struggle from your grasp, you are there to hold us again. We thank you that your mercy never runs dry. And despite our lack of faith, your faithfulness is always present. We thank you that you're patient and your patience is never exhausted, no matter how many times we let you down. So now as we come to worship you, worship you the one and only true God, worthy of all our praise and honour, we thank you that we can come with gladness and thanksgiving and with joy and celebration. We come in awe and wonder, we come in hope and we come in faith. We come to make our confession, confess, confessing that whilst we are never just right with you, that we let you down. But again, this morning, we have that opportunity to deepen our faith, to come back together. We offer our petition for others and we want to bring intercession for this church and for the wider church. So as a faithful God, we thank you that you will come and hear all of our prayers, spoken and unspoken. Almighty and loving God, take our faith, weak though it is, and this morning we pray that you would kindle the sparks of life within us and fan a new flame a new flame of love within our hearts so that we may set out into a new week with renewed purpose to receive and to resolve to live and work for you in the assurance that you are with us every step of the way, this day and forever. And we pray together in the words of the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our reading this morning is from Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 31. That's the last verse of chapter 12 and then all of chapter 13. And I suppose most people will, will know this portion of scripture and it's one that is frequently read at weddings. But in actual fact, the, the background to this chapter is that it was written to the church in Corinth. And in chapter 12, we would read how God gave lots of spiritual gifts to build up the body of Christ. And there was unity in that diversity. And you will know there was lots of parts to the body. And when one part suffers, all parts suffer. Unfortunately, the Corinthians seemed to use the spiritual gifts as almost like toys to play with, and they were falling out. So Paul had to reteach them, refocus their minds on the importance of love over all spiritual gifts. And in Corinthians, Paul puts it, 
his most excellent way. So let us hear the word of God to us today as it's found in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and 13. And now I will show you the most excellent way. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when perfection comes, the imperfect disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put childish ways behind me. Now we see but a poor reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope and love. But the greatest of these is love. We thank God for these words of scripture, asking that he will help us to make sense of them in our own lives. Amen. We're going to sing again, and this time we're singing the song, How Deep the Father's Love. How deep the Father's love for us How vast beyond all measure That he should give his only son To make a wretch his treasure How great the pain of searing loss The Father turns his face away As wounds which mar the chosen one Bring many sons to glory I can't. 
Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of each one of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our God and our Redeemer. Amen. One of the interesting things that I watch on television, and I suppose we all watch a fair bit of TV, but during lockdown and maybe a bit before it, one of the the wonderful things I like is travel programs. And I don't know about you if you are one of those people who like to watch travel and nature programs, lots of reality TV programs. But there seem to be an awful lot of them on in the last year and a half during lockdown, more than I'd ever, ever seen before. Uh, I, I enjoy Kate Humble, and she talked all about the coastline of Cornwall and, and Somerset. Julia Bradbury did a wonderful program, Cornwall and Devon, as she walked. Uh, Susan Kalman, she was following a trail, and Michael Palin, even Adrian Dunbar did one in Ireland. But one of the, the best I'd, I'd seen was of a Scottish coastal railway journey. And Julia Walters retraced some of her childhood memories as she travelled by train from Berwick through the Scottish Highlands. And many of us know Scotland reasonably well. I, I was in Scotland twice during the summer. And it's a wonderful place to, to journey. But one of the most fascinating places that she visited was the small village of Araseg. And Araseg is a small coastal village on the far west. It's probably about 30 to 35 miles slightly northwest of Fort William, so it's fairly far north. And it's just on the coast, and out in the water you would have the Isle of Mull and Skye, so it's out on the side. But the Araseg Estate, which has got a large house, which was built in the 1800s, uh, was a fascinating big building, but it was requisitioned during uh, the war, World War II, and was requisitioned by the British Secret Service for training special operatives. And those special operatives were then smuggled into occupied Europe. And they, they trained Czechs and Poles and all sorts of folk. But there were approximately 60 women trained uh, as special operatives at Araseg. Uh, and one of them was a lady called Violet Zabo. And you might have picked up some of the story of this. Violet was born in France. Uh, her dad was an English uh, British army driver and he married a French girl. And Violet spent most of her younger life in France, so she was a, a fluent French speaker. Uh, she came home with her dad and mum. They came back to England. And later on, she did lots of work, lots of jobs. But because of her fluent English, uh, or fluent French, uh, and her interest in the army with her dad, she began to work for the, the British Land Army. And she then met and uh, married a, a French, he was a French Foreign Legion soldier, and um, she married him, and shortly after they married, they had a, a, a baby daughter. And not long after that, he was killed. He was killed in action. And so grief-stricken was Violet that she decided that she wanted to train to be a special operative, to go in behind army lines, a very dangerous job. So she left her baby daughter 
with her parents and went up to Arasegh to train to be a special operative. And, and part of that training was using cryptographic poetry. Now, I am no literary expert, but a cryptic, cryptographic poem was used to send messages to operatives behind enemy lines. And a poem which is called The Life That I Have was one such poem, and it was written by Violet's special operative instructor, a guy called Leopold Mark. And he had written it following the death of his girlfriend. So it was an important poem to him, but he gave the poem to Violet as she went behind enemy lines. The poem was made famous in a movie in 1958 uh, carve her name with pride. I'm not sure if many of you saw it. I remember seeing it as a child and it was a very upsetting because of course we know the story that Violet was eventually captured by the German army. She was interrogated, she was tortured, taken to Ravensbrück concentration camp where she was executed. So it was a very sad movie. But the poem itself is fascinating. The life that I have. The life that I have is all that I have. And the life that I have is yours. The love that I have of the life that I have is yours and yours and yours. A sleep I shall have, a rest I shall have, yet death will be but a pause. For the peace of my years in the long green grass will be yours and yours and yours. It's a beautiful poem. And it is not a, a spiritual treaty by any sense, but I believe it has deeply theological meaning in relation to our life, our love, and our eternal peace. It was interesting, when I picked up the programme on TV, my brother, who preaches, also picked it up, and we had a conversation over the phone about it. And I said, listen, I will preach on this if you do too. So I'm not sure if he's done that yet. So we're going to use the words of some of, some of the words of the poem today. The life that I have is all that I have. Well, of course, that is all that we have. And of course, it reminded me of a lady in our church back in, in Balamina, and, and she used to quote verses from different people. And one was from C.T. Studd, a missionary. And he's quoted, and you will know this, only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. So what is it that we do for Christ? What is it? I think the answer to that question lies in the second verse of the poem about the love that I have. The love of our life. And that love is yours and yours and yours. So what can I do for Christ? For me personally and perhaps for you, I can own, I can possess Christ's love. Own Christ's love. And do you know when you begin to read the Gospels, and I'm interested to hear that you're starting your, your, your Bible study again in Zoom or whatever way, um, but it's a wonderful way to, to learn together but when you begin to read the Gospels, you begin to see just exactly what Christ's love is. Of course, it was amazing love. We sing about amazing love. But it was amazing for me in how Jesus loved other people. In, uh, summarized in Matthew chapter 9, when Jesus went through the towns and saw the people, he had compassion on them. Jesus was touching people that everyone else was running away from. 
There were outcasts, marginalised, diseased, sick, untouchables. And he touched them, showing them value. And for many who society gave no value, Jesus gave them value. Jesus also affirmed the dignity of women. He treated them well. And that was not the norm in his day. It was something new. Children flocked to Jesus. Why? Because he showed them that they were valued. They were important. He got down to their level, lifting their head, looking into their eyes. He befriended the outcast, women and children. And many didn't like that. They tried to run Jesus out of town, but he remained undeterred. What kind of love is this? And it just wasn't that he touched and healed, but he took time for people. And the way he did that continues to have a great impression upon me. And as a follower of Christ, I have many, met many people like that who live the way Jesus lived. They do, don't and haven't lived a perfect life. They haven't been perfect people. But they lived a life for the sake of others. And I often wondered, why do they do that? What is it? Why would you give your time, why would you give your money to people and for people who cannot give you anything in return? And when I spoke to them, they, they didn't give me a whole lot of important information about their system of beliefs. They didn't start to give me a whole lot of theology. They didn't talk about religious law. And they weren't just nice people. But I discovered that the way they lived was because for them, love had a name. And that name was Jesus. They loved the way Jesus loved for the sake of others. And I was interested when uh, Carol was doing her announcements, you're doing collections for the homeless, for the Simon community. Well, why would you do that? Why would you give to people who can give you nothing in return? You do it because love has a name. And that name is Jesus. And that name very often we hear in, in theology is called that agape love. It's not the filial love. It's not the romantic love. It's the agape love. And in, in Corinthians chapter 13, there are three important numbers. Two, eight, and five. Two is what love is. There are eight things that love is not. And there are five actions that come out of a love that Christ has. Well, what, is the, what are the two? Well, love is patient and love is kind. That's the first two. What is it not? Well, it doesn't envy. It doesn't boast. It's not rude. It's not self-seeking not easily angered, doesn't keep a record of wrongs, and does not delight in evil. Those are not my words. They're straight from Scripture. So what you do in providing for the Simon community, having that selfless concern for the welfare of others, is to do with patience and kindness. You're not boasting to people about it. You're not rude about the people who are receiving that. And it's not about me. It's not a me thing, not self-seeking. That is agape love in reality. 
And what are the actions, the five actions which come out of the godlike agape? Protects, trusts, hopes, perseveres, and never fails. And you think, well, I could never do those, and I think the same. Those are really challenging things for one, each one of us to, to consider. But do you know, we don't do it in our own human strength. It is not of us. But as we come in and as we develop and grow in our relationship with Christ, and we do that whilst we still have breath to breathe. When we come into that relationship with Christ, we begin to understand that God's love is a gift for us to receive. We receive it as a gift. It's not of our own, our own strength. The words um, in John 3 verse 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son. God loved and he gave you see the connection between agape love and a giving God? What did he give? Well, he gave his one and only son. We don't read, he took. We read, God gave. He gives. <laughs> it's his very nature. Love finds its origin and foundation in God himself. And do you know in 1 John chapter 4 we read, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. That is the hope. That is that agape love. And our calling is that we would pour out our love into the lives of others. Because John's Gospel also tells us that a new commandment Jesus gives us, love one another. Do you know, we are in a culture where we don't like to be told what to do. And when we read something that Jesus commands, we don't want to be commanded. We don't want us, anybody to command us to do anything. We don't want to take direction. We don't want to take instruction. But do you know, God's commandments are, are not in a, in, a, in a confrontational way. He wants us to receive and then give it away. Receive his love and give it away. Receive it and share it. Because that is what our faith is. That is what our Christianity is about. It's not about a set of beliefs. Yes, they're important. Of course they are. Not just, but love is not a monument to moralism. But it's a movement of the Holy Spirit calling us day by day, moment by moment. And as followers, God has placed his love in us so that we can overflow into the lives of others. I see it in our church, um, with random acts of kindness, which we refer to often, where somebody will leave a bucket of flowers, used to win the days before COVID, left a bucket of flowers at the front of the church for the ladies to take one on the way past, or left, you know, different gifts for folk. Random acts. But our calling is to be courageous. Courageous with one another and our community with people we know, people we see, people we live with, work with, play with. And that is one of the things that, that happened in our church, our links with Women's Aid and a number of other community groups. And it came out of 24-7, where a courageous telephone call to the offices of Women's Aid, asking, was there anything we could do for them in terms of, could we pray for them? And the lady on the other end of the phone cried and said, no one had ever asked that question of them. Nobody had ever contacted them to say, can we pray for you? And that began a, a whole series of contacts and the beginning of a monthly 
get together with the girls who live in the shelter and with some of the ladies in the church. We, we meet together. It was a prompting of the Holy Spirit which led to that relationship building. And that's how things are done. They're not huge, life, they are life-changing, but they're not things to be beating a big drum about. It led, in fact, to one young lady attending our church on a regular basis and bringing her son to be christened uh, with us, a single mum. And it was lovely. It was just lovely that we were able to provide a fellowship for her. She didn't have any family. So that is what God's love, that is what the love that we have. It is an action love. It's things that we do. And it's as simple as that. And it may be for you, it might be just a conversation tomorrow. It might even be a conversation on the way home. It might be a telephone call. Do you know it might lead to a conversation, do you know, with someone who said, well, do you know, there was a time in my life when I went through something similar. And how can I help you? Those are the loving agape acts. And do you know the great thing about it for me and for you? is that we don't have to be perfect. Do you know, I, a friend of mine wears a t-shirt that says, I'm, 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 I'm so close to being perfect. Um, but that's not true. Do you know, we're not perfect, but we can still be a work in progress and reach out and work for the love and goodness of others. Romans tells us that love must be sincere. If it comes from a sincere heart, we want to hate what is evil, cling to what is good, be devoted to one another, honour one another above yourselves, never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervour, serving the Lord, be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer, share with the Lord's people who are in need and practise hospitality. These are really challenging days for your church and for our church where our numbers are reduced in person and people are staying out of church and when you're staying out of church you tend to feel that not they're not involved they're not engaging with church and we have to find ways to work with the people we have to provide for the people who are here in our church and to build the people up again so that we can continue to go out and be the people of God, practicing our hospitality and loving one another the way Christ called us to do. I pray that as you move on in your journey here in this church, that indeed you will be known for your love in action. And in the words of that poem, that the love that you have will be Christ's love always in your heart. Amen. We're going to now take a moment to pray for the needs of others. So let us pray. God of love, we, we pray for those many, many people in our world who have been deprived of love, who feel unloved, or for whom love has been very, very painful. We ask you, Father God, to touch their hearts afresh with the love of Christ. We pray for those for whom love has involved pain, those who have faced trauma of perhaps the breakdown of marriage, of the collapse of friendships, or broken homes, or who have become estranged from their own family and friends. Perhaps children have moved away to begin new lives of their own, and as we begin to become frail and confused and infirm, feeling isolated, vulnerable and alone. We pray for those whose loved ones have been taken from them, passing on to the next life. And for those, those days are long as they miss their loved ones. 
May the knowledge of your unending love, of your unfailing love, be a constant source of comfort and inspiration. We pray for those who find it hard to love others, for those whose love has been betrayed, for those who are scarred by bitter and painful experiences, perhaps subject to abuse, perhaps with mental illness, oppressed and unable to show their true feelings. Pray, Father God, that you would touch their hearts afresh this morning with your love. Loving God, we bring before you this very complex world that we live in. And it's not just a complex world of technology, but it's a complex world of human relationships. They are capable of bringing us such joy, yet such sorrow. We can have so much pleasure, yet so much pain. And we thank you for the gift of love and all that love that surrounds us, we thank you. But help us never to forget those who have lost that and who've been hurt through it. So restore their faith in what love can do for them. Help them to find love and share it with others. Grant to us all the knowledge that your love will never fail. And as we, as we think of, of, of the greater world of human relationships, we bring it down to the community where this church is based. Uh, we bring it down to the very church community. And for those who have lost their faith, those who are struggling with faith at this time, uh, isolated, perhaps fearful, and for others who just can't be bothered, feeling that perhaps church no longer needs to function or be important for them. Father, may it be that your love would, would touch them again to show them that there's so much more to a loving relationship than looking down the lens of a television screen. So we pray for all those who are involved in leadership within this church, we pray particularly for its minister, for Tommy and for Don, his wife and his family, asking Father that you would strengthen him for the task that lies ahead, praying that you would give him courage, boldness as he preaches. Lord, keep him wise to the workings of the church and help him in every way with good leaders around him that this church would know the benefit of his ministry in the years that he spends here. So, Father, we, we thank you. We gather all those prayers up now, uh, praying for those who we love, those whom we've lost, and those whom we are excited to see again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our closing hymn is, You Shall Go Out With Songs of Resurrection. You Shall Go Out With Courage and With Strength. Let's stand together and sing. Go out from strength. 
And now as we journey out into the world, may each of us walk in the light of God's ways, striving to be blameless and just. May our hearts be vessels of God's love and may the Lord bless us in the land that we are entering. Hold fast. Do not be led astray. And may the love of God be yours this day and forevermore. Amen.